Last class period, we learned how to solve a circuit, right? How to solve a circuit if we know the voltages and the resistances, or not the voltages, the voltage sources and the resistances. So we know what we're connecting. Then we can calculate what the current is everywhere in the circuit, what the voltage drop is. So just to make sure that we remember the steps, the first, by the way, there's a clicker question coming up with the first slide when I move forward. So the first step in the way I do this, just to make sure that I don't get myself confused, is to go ahead and make sure for every resistor, identify what current is going through that resistor. If you have a branch, a branch being a line that goes from essential node to essential node, so the current that starts in the branch has no option but to keep going through the branch, then you just use that same current. So you don't say like I1 through R1 and I2 through R2. You say the current that goes here goes everywhere until I get to another essential node. Now this presupposes that you remember the term essential node. Essential nodes are the places where three or more circuit, circuit elements join together. So you, you know, this circuit is here only has, well, it has zero essential nodes, right? This, it's all, always two things. But you identify the current through each resistor, then go through and make sure you identify which direction is the positive side and which one's the negative side. How do you know which side is positive and which side is negative for a resistor? You look at the direction of the current arrow. Because a resistor takes away energy and voltage is the potential energy per unit charge, then you know that the side the current enters on will be a higher voltage and the side that it leaves on will be lower. So I go through and I actually mark plus and minus on each resistor so I won't get confused about my voltage drops. Once you've done that, you identify each essential node and then you apply Kirchhoff's current law on all but one of the essential nodes. Why not all of the essential nodes? The last one would be redundant. It would be a linear combination of the rest. So you do all but one of the essential nodes. You use Kirchhoff's current law, which says the sum of the currents into the node equals the sum of the currents leaving the node. It's just a, a, a way of saying charge is conserved. Then the next step is identify each of the smallest loops, the meshes, to cover the entire circuit, and then apply Kirchhoff's voltage law on each mesh. Kirchhoff's voltage law says you go around the circuit, you track voltage rises and drops. At the end, you'll find that your rises and drops balance. You have the same voltage beginning and ending. You don't gain potential energy or lose potential energy doing the complete circuit. Once you have all these equations, you should have the same number of equations as you have unknowns, and you ideally put it in the calculator and solve it. So that's what we went through for class on Friday. Your homework, I think it is three of the problems, require you to use those steps. So if you have questions about them, you know, feel free to come and talk to me or to review the, you know, the lectures online if that's your speed. Um, but make sure you understand how to do it because in lab tomorrow, what we're gonna be doing in lab is checking out some bigger circuits. We'll have one circuit that has three meshes and uh, four essential nodes. And so it's gonna be something where you need to use a spreadsheet or your calculator and a, a matrix to solve it in any kind of quick fashion. And I will provide a spreadsheet that will do the, um, the matrix math for you, the linear algebra, so you don't have to go through it. I know Alex is all keen to do it himself now that he's in linear algebra, but. So I just wanna make sure that, that we're up to, up to speed on that and that nobody goes into lab tomorrow saying, oh man, I haven't figured this out yet, because then lab will be a lot harder. Today, we're gonna to talk about RC transient circuits. RC here means resistor capacitor, not radio control, just in case. So this picture is showing a basic RC circuit. It has a resistor, it has a capacitor. They're in series with a battery. 
under steady state conditions, nothing special happens here. Because if I have steady state conditions, that is if my circuit's been like this for a very long time, I will have had charge that flows from the battery to the capacitor to charge up the capacitor. And once the capacitor is charged, what is it storing? Charge capacitor stores energy in the form of an electric field or a charge separation. So it's just storing energy. And it's going to have a voltage since V or Q is equal to VC, it'll have a voltage across it. And there'll be no current flowing because the charge won't be changing. And so the, it's a really boring circuit. So we don't spend a lot of time looking at that circuit. What we talk about is the transient circuit, the circuit that's changing. So that's why this circuit shows a switch. You have the switch. So you start, for instance, with the switch open. So the switch is open. If the switch is open, how much current flows? None, because you don't have a circuit. You close the switch and simultaneously you say, I'm going to start my clock when I close the switch, because that's the reasonable time to start your clock. And when you close that switch, suddenly you're going to have a voltage difference across the capacitor. And you're going to have a voltage difference across the resistor. And so you're going to have charge start to flow. But as the charge flows, well, you started with simple rule about the capacitor. Capacitors, the voltage across the capacitor is proportional to the charge separation. So you can't have the voltage jump. At the instant I flip the switch, the voltage across the capacitor is going to stay at zero. And so if the voltage across the capacitor is zero, where is the entire EMF of the battery going to drop? You only have three things. You go up across the battery, and then you have down. You can have the resistor and the capacitor, but the capacitor's voltage drop is zero. Where's all the voltage drop going to have to be? The resistor. So the instant you flip that switch, the entire voltage drop is across the resistor, which means you can calculate the initial current as current initial is equal to the EMF of the battery divided by R. So it starts with that current. Of course, current is charge flowing. So as soon as you get charge flowing, you start charging the capacitor. But if you charge the capacitor, then the voltage across the resistor is going to drop. And if the voltage across the resistor drops, what happens to the current through the resistor? Since I is V over R, if V drops, what's going to happen to the current? It's going to drop as well. That's what Brittany said, just for everyone's. Yeah. So the current is going to start at this maximum value, but then it's going to drop. And it's dropping proportional to how much charge has passed. So it's going to drop at a changing rate. So if we were to plot, this is plotting the voltage. If we plotted the current as a function of time, it would start up here at this and end at zero. And the current would look like that. Now this here is plotting the voltage on the capacitor. The voltage on the capacitor had to be zero initially. You pass charge to it and the voltage starts rising. But the rate at which it charges has to slow as the current slows. And so the charging slows. Now, how do we get the shape of this curve? At least four people should raise their hands. Yeah, integrals. It comes from doing calculus because current is the rate of charge flow. It's a derivative. And so we can make a calculus equation and solve it. Obviously, for this class, we don't do that. Guess what we're doing tomorrow 
my friends. We're doing that. Do you want to come to the calculus class? So what we find is that the current as a function of time is going to be equal to that peak current times e to the minus t over rc, where r is the resistance and c is the capacitance. So that's the equation for the current that's going to flow in this circuit when you connect that switch and it starts charging the capacitor. It starts with a high current, the EMF over the resistance, and then it drops exponentially. And this RC, what are the units of RC? Just looking at the exponent, what do the units of an exponent always have to be? Unitless. So if time has units of seconds, what is RC going to have units of? So it's the time constant in units of seconds. So we usually write this as actually I is equal to the current peak e to the minus t over tau, where tau is that RC time constant. So that's the equation for the current that's going to flow through the circuit. And then we have the voltage across the capacitor. Well, voltage across the resistor, let's do that first. If that's the current, what's the voltage across the resistor? By definition, by Ohm's law, voltage across the resistor is Yeah, I went really around the barn to get to the final answer. But the voltage across the resistor is the EMF, the voltage of my power supply, times E to the minus T over tau. The voltage across the resistor is going to have an exponential drop just the same as the current did. But then the equation for the voltage across the capacitor, which is the one that's given to us. That's the graph that was shown. So how's the voltage across the capacitor? Okay, here we go. How's the voltage across the capacitor relate to the voltage across the resistor? It's what? They're not the same. We find the relationship using one of Kirchhoff's laws. Which law do you think is going to be useful to find the voltage across the capacitor? Probably the voltage law. So if we use Kirchhoff's voltage law, some of the voltages on the loop equals zero equals the EMF minus the voltage across the resistor minus the voltage across the capacitor. So that means the voltage across the capacitor is equal to the EMF minus voltage across the resistor, which is EMF minus parentheses EMF e to the minus T over tau. equals the EMF so there's the equation for the voltage across the capacitor which is what is plotted in this graph so just from looking at this without even going to our our first slide we've covered 90 percent of what my goal was for today truly to understand the transient behavior we see now that when we start charging the capacitor the capacitor will initially charge quickly and then slow down and it has an exponential rate of charging the current has an exponential drop in its current when we're charging the capacitor does anyone have questions about the work I've done up to this point? 
Is it pretty clear? Nice. I appreciate seeing yes. Erica, Erica, excuse me. Um, so just could you clarify a little more why it's went from like just an I to an I-O? Um, well, this I-0 is the peak. That That's the current at the instant that you start. Whereas I would be the current at any time. Yep. All right. Now we're going to start with a clicker question for the actual slides. Which terminal has a more positive voltage in the figure below? So notice I have terminal A, terminal B. I have the current indicated. You just say which terminal A or B has the more positive voltage or are they the same or is this a situation where you don't have enough information? Uh, it erased the numbers for me. Hey, Michaela answered again. <laughs> so, okay, stop it. <laughs> I wish I could just stop this. There. Yeah. Uh, I'll have to figure out how to fix that because now some people are going to have more answers than other people. It's not really your fault. Um, it was a pretty large group of people. I didn't memorize because I didn't think about it, that said B. And that is the correct answer, B. And so, Gila, how did we come up with B being the correct answer? Okay, that is a reasonable explanation. It's not the way I explain it, but you need to have it in your head the way that makes sense to you. The way I explain it is that we know a resistor is going to take away energy, so the voltage, the potential energy per charge, has to be higher on the side the current entered than the side it left. But Gila's reasoning also made perfect sense, that we know that the current should flow out of the positive voltage and toward negative voltage, so that means that the side that's toward the current source, that's where it's coming out of the positive of the current source, should be the positive on your resistor. So both of those work. Um, sometimes it gets confusing using Gila's method because you're not sure. But once you draw the arrow, you can always take it the way Gila did and say, well, that must mean that the positive voltage source is over here where it's coming from. And I don't know why I left this in here. I saw it after I had prepared things, and then I was like, what's it doing there? I don't know. Let's see if we can get everything to work properly this time. <laughs> okay. Let's go for it. You can answer now. Erica, you're in just in case. You're the only person who said to answer before I said you can answer. When adding resistors, which configuration results in the highest resistance? Series? or parallel, or they give the same, or there's no way of telling. Hey, of course, so you answered. Yeah. Yeah. I, I didn't even, it, it didn't show up and I didn't wait for you because I just assumed you didn't have it. <laughs> okay, Brittany, you're still waiting for you. All right, so we have 17 said series, three said parallel, zero for the others. So the correct answer here was when you add resistors, series is always the one that gives you bigger because you have R total is equal to R1 plus R2 plus etc. 
If you put them in parallel, it's the one over R total equals one over R1 plus one over R2 plus et cetera. And so in parallel is always going to make it smaller. In series, we'll always make it bigger when you're adding resistors. Of course, resistors aren't the only things we've learned about. So the same question, when adding capacitors, then what? Two, one. Okay. Okay, this time we had a big group on parallel, which is correct again, because with capacitors, it's not the same rule. It came from because the rule that capacitors in series all have the same charge which means that the voltage you get is much bigger for the same charge. So different way it works, different outcome. Parallel gave me capacitor total is equal to capacitor one plus capacitor two plus. And series was like that for capacitors. So capacitors, resistors, the opposite rule, which is, well, I think kind of fun. Now I've talked this slide already in detail. So let's go to discharging a capacitor. Charging a capacitor, discharging a capacitor. Those are basically the two transient things we do with a capacitor, charge and discharge. So the charging, initially it charged rapidly and then the charging rate slowed over time to asymptotically approach zero. If we discharge, if you look at this circuit, this is actually the simpler circuit. There's no power supply. There's just a capacitor and a resistor. Now, this circuit by itself would be a lame circuit because the capacitor can't get charged. So the way these circuits are actually built is something like this. A battery, a resistor, a three-way switch, or I don't know if it's called three-way. I get my switches confused. Capacitor, another resistor, and a switch that at time equals zero moves from being connected to the battery side to, to connected to the discharge side. If you use something like a disposable camera, if you turn on the flash of the disposable camera, it's doing exactly this. You turn on the flash and the switch moves over to the left position. If you have the flash turned off, the switch is just in the vertical position, not touching anything. You put, you put, turn on the flash, it switches over, and you actually will hear a little whine as it starts charging. And so that switch comes over and it charges just like we saw. So it does most of its charging quickly, but it takes a while to get fully charged because the rate of charge slows over time. So that's why you put it on charge and you wait, what, 10 seconds or so before you actually take the picture. How do people know what I'm talking about? I talk about a disposable camera with a charge with a flash. Okay. Because, you know, when I was a kid, that's not the way it worked. We didn't have disposable cameras. My grandma bought me a 110 Instamatic, you know. Had flash cubes, which were awesome because flash cubes, okay. There were flash cubes and magic cubes. And mine had the kind that would ignite without having to have a battery. So you could just be out there in the middle of nowhere and 
get a little pokey thing and poke in there and make it go flash. It's cool. <laughs> of course, there's only four flashes on a cube, and then you have to buy another one because um, it has four bulbs. So it's there, and then when you take the picture is when that switch flips from charging to discharging. And it dumps all of the, what have you stored in that capacitor? Charge separation or? In this case, I want to be clear, we stored energy in the form of electric field or charge separation. It dumps all of that energy through the discharge resistor. And so initially, when this flips, so now we'll look back at this picture that doesn't have the charging half of the circuit. Initially, when you close that circuit, you have your full voltage here. And the only thing that voltage can drop across is the capacitor. So the capacitor and the resistor are going to have to have the same voltage. And initially with a large voltage, what does that make your current? Large voltage difference across the resistor means the current is large. But as it discharges, the voltage drops, and so the current is dropping. And so you have an exponential drop in current and an exponential drop in voltage. So the voltage on the capacitor is equal to the initial voltage e to the minus t over tau. What is tau? It's the time constant. It's resistance times capacitance. Resistance in units of ohms, capacitance in units of farads, and an ohm times a farad is one second. And of course, the current is equal to, maybe I should have put voltage capacitance equals voltage resistor. So current is voltage capacitance over resistance is equal to. So the current and voltage curves look alike on the discharge. Now going back to the disposable camera, I said if you wait like 10 seconds to charge, it takes a reasonably long time to charge. How long does it take to discharge? Much less, right? It's a blink of an eye. And we in the web family take that blink of an eye very seriously. <laughs> Start off with the fact that we all have these little squinty eyes, so it's impossible to find a picture where we're not squinting because it doesn't matter what the light conditions are, we squint. And then we all blink when we get that flash. It's very quick discharging, but it's taking a long time to charge. How can we have a different time for charge and discharge? What is setting the time that it takes to charge and discharge? <clears throat> Where did time come into these equations? There is time in the equations on the screen. Where is it? It's in the exponent. And it's always time divided by tau. And so if tau is a big number, then you're not going to have much change in that exponent, so it's going to change slowly. If tau is a small number, it's going to change rapidly. So the bigger the RC time constant, the longer it's going to take to charge or discharge. The shorter it is, the quicker. So if we look at our charging circuit, we want to charge slowly. But discharge rapidly in the charging circuit what is my time constant what's the resistance that the capacitor sees when it's charging
While charging, the switch is in the left-hand position. Which resistor does it see? RC. So that's going to be the charging resistance times the capacitance is the time constant for when it charges. If we want that to be a long time to charge, why long time charge? Keep the current down, have less loss in the wires, less uh, trying to draw current that the battery can't supply. So we have a large resistance there for the charging side of the circuit. For the discharging side, then it sees the R discharge. And for it to discharge quickly, that R discharge has to be a small resistance. And so that's how the speed of the charging and discharge is controlled. You have the same capacitor for both. And then you use very different resistances for the charging and discharging. So this is an example of how a capacitor can be used in a real circuit. The charging, well, the flash lamp circuit for your disposable camera has a capacitor there for the sole purpose of allowing you to charge up a bunch of, take a bunch of energy from the battery and put it on the capacitor. Why do you do that? Why not just connect the battery? Why not just have a switch that momentarily connects the battery to the bulb? Why don't we just do that? It's sure a lot easier. What Alex said, because I heard it fairly, a battery has a very, well, relatively small amount of current that it can supply. Not nearly enough current to do what we need with our flashlight. So we can't use the battery as the driver for the flashlight because it can't supply enough current. So we charge this capacitor that if we were to just put a wire with no resistance, it would do drop all of that energy instantly. And so we can drop it a lot quicker. Great. Now let's talk common sense. I carry in my pocket this cell phone. And what do I have to do after every day when I go to bed? Charge it. And if I'm going to do something stupid like, I don't know, fly from here to California and I want to watch videos in the airport, and I, I'm going to have to charge more than once in a day. And it's kind of annoying, isn't it? Especially if you have something that's bigger, you know, say you're using an iPad. iPads, you burn a lot of power with those iPads, right? And so you have to do a lot of charging. And so people say, well, we need a better battery. A battery we can charge faster. But batteries are kind of limited because what you're doing is regenerating a chemical reaction, right? It's all based on these chemical reactions and you just, you can't drive it so, you know, super fast. But a capacitor, we put a small resistance, we can charge it super fast. And then we could use a bigger resistance for the output side to take it out slowly. That sounds great, doesn't it? So you can make a capacitor, in theory, you set yourself up with a, a nice, you know, 15 amp charger, you can charge super fast if it's capacitor. No problems. Except for little things like what happens if your phone gets damaged, you know? Your phone falls and hits a nail. Falls and hits a nail. Right now you have the battery, and that battery can do some little exploding things, right? We've all heard of Samsung Galaxy 7s or whatever it was. Galaxy 7 Plus. Oh, well, Galaxy Note 7 Plus. The one that explodes? Yes, that one. That was a real problem, right? Why? Do you know, I, I'm trusting my brother to have done research on this. What was the ultimate problem with those Galaxy Note 7 Plus phones? Was it? Well, yeah, but what made them blow up? There were a lot of stories. Initially, Samsung said, well, you know, we, uh, we made some batteries ourselves, you know, try to increase our scope of things, and we think those batteries have a problem. So they replaced them all. They said, now they're safe. 
And then people's phones kept starting fires. And so then they said, oh, our original manufacturer was also bad. Those batteries, they, they're lithium ion batteries. And if you have an impurity in there, then it can overheat and cause those problems. So that's what they thought the problem was, is impurities in their chemicals for the chemical reaction. But after they saw that the ones coming from the other supplier also had problems, they had to do some deeper diving. And what they ended up determining, at least this is what my brother told me, and I believe that young man, is that to try to conserve space, they didn't give their phones enough space to expand when warm. Because when you charge it, it gets warm. When you use it, it gets warm. And as the battery gets warm, it expands by thermal expansion, basically. At least that's the way my brother explained it. And so they made it so tight that the battery didn't have room to expand, and the battery was breaking because it didn't have room to expand. Kind of a problem. Now, if you go to a supercapacitor, what problems could you have for your phone to have supercapacitor in it? If the battery gets damaged, what's it going to do? It's going to drop all of its energy in like an instant. That Samsung one wasn't able to drop all of its energy in an instant. It was kind of limited because batteries are limited by their chemical reactions. But a supercapacitor would be able to charge instantly and discharge instantly. That would be really, really unsafe if something goes wrong. It'd be wonderful if nothing goes wrong. By the way, just in case you've seen popular things you see on YouTube with phones. Popping corn. Seen that? It's fake, okay? Yes, these put out microwaves. Microwave ovens put out microwaves. You can't pop corn with the amount of energy released by these. Um, People have actually done this because they saw it on the internet. The internet wouldn't lie. How can you quickly charge your phone? In the microwave. Yeah, you stick in the microwave. They don't tell you because they don't want you to know. Don't do that, okay? Because I, I know you're being facetious. And, and so I'm going to answer in kind. Well, if you thought taking the Tide Pod challenge was a good idea, then yeah, go ahead. Because that's the kind of people who do these things. Okay, so those last two things weren't relevant. The rest of it was. Capacitors are very useful for storing energy. They can deliver energy very quickly, but sometimes it's not safe to deliver energy very quickly. Okay, another example of a circuit with, circuit with capacitance. A light bulb can be operated, of course, some light bulbs, well, all light bulbs that we are used to, run on AC. This is using a battery to get an alternating current using a, um, a capacitor. You have a light bulb that has a high resistance. You have another resistor up here. Current comes from the battery and charges the capacitor. When you get a high enough voltage on the capacitor, you'll have a high enough voltage on the light bulb for current to suddenly pass. And so you charge that capacitor until you get to a certain voltage and then current flows. This light bulb is a special kind of light bulb that will not operate unless you have a very high voltage. And so you get to a high enough voltage, it operates, gives off light, but then the capacitor is supplying a lot of the energy to give it light. The voltage drops in the capacitor, the light bulb turns back off. When the light bulb turns off, the capacitor charges again. And so what this does is it creates an oscillating voltage signal. Now that's not your typical AC, but it creates an oscillating voltage signal that then could be used for timing things or other stuff as well. So that's another example of using a capacitor in a circuit. What to me is much more common for capacitor circuit is this. If you have a circuit that is a direct current circuit, one of the things that you really like is to have a constant voltage. So let's say that you have a car and in that car you 
you want to have some good deep bass sounds. You want to be able to thump and somebody mile down the road say, yeah, Richard's playing his car stereo again. You guys have experience with this? Has anyone put that kind of a system in their car? No judging, just ask if anyone had personal experience. Or put it in somebody else's car. No? Well, if you put that in, one of the things you learn right away is that that bass speaker uses a lot of energy. And so when you have that bolt, it will actually pull the voltages down on everything else, and so the volume of everything drops when the thump goes. Well, nobody wants that. That's not high fidelity sound. So what do you do? You put in something that can store energy and deliver it when that thump is occurring. And so for that sound system, they put in really big capacitors. Really big capacitors so they can store a huge amount of energy in that capacitor. And then when their speeder go, their woofer goes bump, it drops a huge amount of energy from that capacitor while the voltage stays high. So that's a very practical example of how it's used in lots of different circuits. It's used to keep a constant voltage where the circuit may draw more here and draw less there. How many people have heard of the fiasco with Apple slowing down certain phones when they're getting older and the battery is getting low? Okay, I saw a number of people raise their hands. Why were they doing that? Is what? Okay. Yila said what we all feel inside. They slow down the old one so they can sell newer ones. Apple had a different answer. Apple said it's actually because people really didn't like it when their phone said it was at 30% battery and it shut down on them. How many people have heard of that problem? Yeah, you have it. That problem is because when the battery is lower, if you have an older battery, if it's a brand new battery, it's not a problem. But if you have an older battery, then it's not able to supply as much current. And when you do something that's like graphics intensive, the graphics processor in your phone draws a lot of power. You might have noticed your phone getting hot when you do something that's graphics intensive. It's because of all the power. I guess I'm um, because of all the power it's using. And so if you have an older battery, when you do something that's graphics intensive, that internal resistance of the battery is too large, the voltage drops too much, and it says, whoa, we're not getting enough voltage from the battery, we've got to shut her down. And so that's the reason that people were having the problems with their iPhone 6 Pluses or 6S Pluses, whatever it was, there's a few phones that have problems was because they were having the voltage, the terminal voltage was dropping too much when they were at a lower charge and using something that was battery intensive. And so Apple's response was for these devices, when your battery charge is lower, we're just gonna slow the clock speed down so we slow the rate at which energy is being consumed so the voltage doesn't drop and it doesn't say you're at 30% and now your battery's dead. Now with the new operating system, which I got the beta for yesterday, you're supposed to be able to turn that feature off if you like. So basically you have the option of it shuts down randomly when it says 30% or it slows down when it's at 30%. But at least it puts you in charge now. It also is supposed to have a diagnostic to tell you the state of your battery, if it's in good shape or not, because you can go and get your battery replaced for $29, I think for any iPhone at this point, um, until next January. And so you can look and see the diagnostic. It says your battery is in poor shape. Just go pay $29 in the Apple store and get a new battery. Good times. So I think Apple's trying to make good on a really bad PR situation. It was bad PR one way, bad PR another. None of it is bad. Now, Steve Jobs, you're holding it wrong. I don't know if you guys remember that. Um, the antenna, you could short it out with your hand, basically, and that yeah, was bad. Okay, so capacitors. One more thing on the capacitor. We talked about a keyboard. Uh, was it last class period? 
And we talked about the keyboard anyway. At home, I have these really sweet lamps on my bed that I just reach up and touch it and it turns it off, right? I love that because in the middle of the night, I don't want to sit there and try to find the switch. And I know I could get the clapper and go <laughs> to turn on the lights, but I think that's kind of lame too. It was a great idea. Just, you know, got bad publicity and now I feel bad about it. So I have a lamp that I just touch to turn it on. How does that baby work? I know the hot tip is what we're talking about. How do you think it works? <clears throat> it's got to be something to do with capacitance. It has a capacitor between a higher voltage area and the surface. And when I touch it, I ground the surface, and it's going to lower the voltage on the other side of the capacitor because the capacitor voltage can't instantly jump. It takes time for charge to flow. And when it measures that drop in the voltage, it says, hey, somebody touched it, and it changes the switch. Genius, right? Capacitors have some real uses. We'll talk when we get to AC about more uses for the capacitors. I'm going to stop here because